Turn to Joshua chapter 11 as we continue in this um, incredible book, which by the way, we're going to do one more chapter next week, and then I, God has put on my heart a two-week Christmas uh, back-to-back sort of series um, leading into that, um, those couple of weeks. I want to give a real big shout out too to our girls ministry uh, led by Amanda Bazinet. What a tremendous job they did. Yep, amen, last week. And uh, just met with Amanda and we're looking forward to another banner year. Um, but Amanda, you did an outstanding job um, unpacking chapter 10. And we saw the band of five kings, right? Um, in the southern part of Canaan that were trying to fight the Israelites. Um, and we saw the supernatural power of God um, in their midst. And more than this, I, I love how Amanda emphasized the participation of the people of God. Because it's powerful to see God move in a miraculous way, but it's when you and I are active participants in the plan of God that we can see God move in the miraculous and see the promises of God fulfilled. It requires our participation. Can I get an amen? amen. Uh, and, and I want to say this, like, never underestimate the fact that you are a child of God. Trying our best to, to walk humbly before the Lord and walk out the blueprint of your life that God has for you and what the implications of that are both in the now and in eternity. Never underestimate that. When you know, does anybody here know I'm a child of God? Yes. And you're saying, I, amen. Amen. He gave us the right to become children of God. And that in that right to become a child of God, when you know you're a child of God and you say, God, I just want every day to try my best to walk out what you have for my life. I, I know you have a plan for humanity, humanity and you've implemented me as part of that plan that you have, that there is no boundaries, there's no limits to what God can and will do in and through your life and that promises can and will be fulfilled in your life and in others around you. Um, so today, I'm just going to read one verse in the chapter that we're going to cover today. Um, and it's really to show what happens when the dust settles on the promises of God being fulfilled. We're going to cover the whole chapter, but I just want to read one verse. And it's at the very end. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord had spoken to Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance to Israel according to their tribal allotments. And the land had rest from war. Can somebody say the word rest? Yes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. It is infallible, it is inerrant, and it comes from you. It is the very same power that when you spoke, spoke universes into existence, spoke everything that was not, that is into existence. And that is the type of word that we get to unpack and open. It is the living word of God. And so I thank you, Lord, that it will come forth and it will accomplish precisely what you desire it to accomplish. And so having said that, Lord, I pray that any bit of demonic opposition, any walls, any hindrances, any preconceptions, Conceived notions, God, any distractions that would keep your word from penetrating a human soul, heart, and spirit and having its way, may it be removed, I pray, in this time, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. So God put this word in my heart as I prayed and studied this past week regarding chapter 11. And what God gave me was, all fight, no flight. Let me hear you say, all fight, no flight. All fight, no flight. Amen. So things have progressed up to this point. Okay, things have gone from uh, sort of bad to worse, if you will, seemingly in the natural eye. They've gone from fighting singular locations, right, single locations, one at a time, to then you've got multiple kings now in the southern region, five bands of kings, to now a massive region pulling together in the northern kingdom. And I want to take a side note real quick and say something about Joshua's military strategy that God gave him. Joshua's military strategy, and this is something you can take away from this, was to first go into the heart of Canaan. He came right into the center of Canaan, and he divided it immediately, north and south. Anytime there is division, you can expect that it won't stand long. Can I get an amen? God knew that. He knew bringing a divisive insertion of the people of Israel right into the heart, or as we said two weeks ago, into the heart, 
right into the heart. <laughs> Stabbed a stake into the heart of Caden. That he knew that he could divide the north and the south immediately. So he comes into the center. Then he takes a dip south. And they fight the southern part of Canaan. And now they're going to head north. But when they come north, they don't realize that there's this king there named Jabin. And Jabin, the king of Hazor, hears of what's happening. I want you to note that. He hears what's going on. He knows about the children of Israel. And he begins to bring together an army. And it basically, as we're going to read, he pulls them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. The north, the south, the east, and the west. Here's another concept, something in scripture that I want you to pull and glean from. That whatever the enemy attempts, God has a word and a promise to cancel it out. Can I get an amen? Amen. You see, what the enemy, what the king didn't realize was that earlier, God had already promised Abram. He said, walk the land, Abram. Walk the breadth of it. I want you to walk to the north, the south, the east, and the west. I'm giving you all of it, Abram. I'm giving you everything to the north, the south, the east, and the west. And so this king thought, if I just pull from those four places, we'll surely win. But he didn't realize God had already spoken a word. Amen. And so in the first few verses, we see a coalition. We see he pulls from the northern hill country, from the south in Chinneroth, the lowland, the west, the east, the west, the hill country. And if you look on a map, it's literally the north, the south, the east, and the west. He's pulling from every possible location. And as a result, the scriptures begin to speak in this hyperbole, in this hyperbolic terminology. In other words, an exaggeration of terms. And it says that the horde, in verse 4, was numbered like the sand that's on the seashore. Numbered like the sand. That's on, so this hyperbole of what's taking place. And then he says there's very many horses, if you keep reading, and very many chariots. And so first century historian Josephus, I don't know if you've ever read any of his work, but pretty intriguing. <laughs> you guys like never heard of him or read any of his like. And his book of antiquities uh, lays out what, and I'm not sure what his sources were, but what the size of the army was. He said there was 300,000 foot soldiers, 20,000 chariots, and 10,000 men on horses ready to fight. This will be Israel's largest battle to date. This is going to be the biggest battle they've ever fought. And I want you to note something. That what led them to this massive horde, this massive battle, this onslaught and attack against them was their obedience to God. That's a hard pill to swallow. See, it's one thing to have to experience consequences as a result of disobeying God, but it's another to obey God and find yourself fighting an entire army that's numbered like the sand of the sea. And you're like, wait a second, God, I, I, I thought if I followed you, this would happen and that would happen. I hope you never have a come to Jesus and get type mentality. There are a lot of byproducts, don't get me wrong, but don't ever let somebody give you a, 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 this lie, this facade that coming to Jesus is going to be a bed of roses laid out before you. You're never going to have another fight, never have another battle. In fact, it's quite the contrary. If I have people who say, man, after I got saved, things got harder, things got worse. And I'm like, thank God, because that will teach you to rely and lean on Jesus Christ. Amen. Note this, obedience does not equate lack of opposition. It's quite the contrary. Some of you know when you got saved, that's when the battle really began. When you came to Christ or when you walked with Jesus, all of a sudden you're fighting all these different battles. You're fighting all these different things and the enemy's trying to come at you this way and that way. From the north, the south, the east, and the west. But I'm here to tell you, no matter how many ways the enemy comes, your best day will never compare to your worst day serving Jesus. I don't care how good you think you had it serving the world. It will never compare to knowing I am eternal. But I don't care if I'm in the deepest valley of the shadow of death as long as Jesus is there with me. I don't care if I'm in the boat and the storm's coming and the waves are crashing as long as Jesus is in the boat with me. Can I get an amen? amen. Praise Jesus for that. Jeremiah was not joking. In Jeremiah chapter 12 and verse 5, if you're taking notes, Jeremiah 12, 5, he said, if you have raced with the men on foot, and they wearied you, how will you compete with the horses? In other words, you thought it was tough when you fought the people hand to hand. It's going to get worse. You thought it was tough now. Wait till you keep walking forward. New levels, new devils. Or here's a new one God gave me in prayer. New heights, new fights. <laughs> I'm going to start. <laughs> Never mind, I'm done with this. I can't do it. 
I can't do it. Merchandise, 2024. <laughs> new heights, new fights. Because up to this point, there's been no horses. There's been no chariots. In fact, the majority of their stuff's been divine intervention. It's been God intervening. It's been God showing up, and it's been them hand-to-hand -hand combat. But now they're going to fight an army bigger than them, more sophisticated than them. And I, I got to ask you, like, what do you do when you're backed into a corner, church? Like, what do you do when the odds are stacked against you? What do you do when the enemy has raised up a horde, so to speak, to come against your peace of mind, to come against your family, to come against your home, to come against your finances, to come against you personally, come against your job? You fill in the blank. What do you do when the enemy tries to instill fear in your heart? Because that's at the core of it. That's what's at the core. Amen. The enemy would love by any way or means possible to instill fear. False evidence appearing real. Psychologists tried to pin it this way, even though this is, a, I believe, an instilled piece of our divine DNA. They call it fight or flight. Fight or flight. It's this acute neurological response when you find yourself in direct opposition to something. When you find yourself in a place of attack or heavy opposition, it's fight or flight. And it comes down to you're either going to, to rise up and fight back or, or you're going to run for it. It's a response mentally, physically, or, and as a pastor, I would say even spiritually. And so I got to ask you, what do you do? What do you do when push comes to shelf? tie your shoes you fight at the air you get your gymnastics clothes on <laughs> and maximize everything he has entrusted to me i will fight my battle is not against flesh and blood but against a spiritual enemy who opposes me so I will draw the battle lines and face my enemy with a bold determination. My enemy fights against me because he fears me. Every time I resist him, he must flee. And every time he reminds me of my past, I will remind him of his future. I will make no excuses, but through every obstacle I will find a way. I will not procrastinate my progress. I will not defer my destiny. I will not waver when I'm weak. I will not cower when my circumstances take a turn for the worse. Because greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I will fight. Even if I lose the battle, I will win the war. Because I am more than a conqueror through him who loves me. I will reject the lies that echo in my mind, telling me that I don't have what it takes, that my best is behind me, or that humiliation awaits me. The devil is a liar. And my God always causes me to triumph. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord, I will fight. I'm unashamed to represent a kingdom that is unshakable. No one will be able to stand against God's plan for me all the days of my life. With my God, I will advance against every troop. With his help, I will scale every wall. Though my enemies surround me, my God surrounds my enemies. Though they may come in me one way, they will flee seven ways. Because no weapon formed against me will prosper. And every evil thing that rises against me, I will condemn, I will fight. My heart is steadfast. My purpose is immovable. I am always abounding in the work of the Lord. And my potential is unlimited because the limitless God lives within me. I will fight. The cross is before me. The world is behind me. I'll never turn back. I'll never give up. I'll never settle. I'll never stop short. I will press toward the mark for the prize that is already mine. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height, nor depth, nor anything else in all shall be able to separate me from my God. And if my God is for me, who can be against me? I will fight. 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 
All I can think about when I watch that is that we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings created by God having a human experience. And that I hope you know and understand that your physical body, your mortal body, is the very house of the DNA and power of God. And that is why we can stand our ground. That is why we don't have to flight. Why it's always all fight and no flight. Because it is the spirit of God that lives in you. And when I think about the book of Acts, he said, you'll receive power when my spirit has come upon you. That you hold and house the power and the DNA and the dynamite of God within you. You've just got to tap into that and know that God is within me. And he who is within me is greater than he that comes against me. Can I get an amen? And it boils down to Psalm 20, verse 7 and 8. It describes it with accuracy, what we're seeing in chapter 11. Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord. Say, the name of the Lord. Amen. Not bad. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. Hebrews 10, 39 says, we are not among those who shrink back and are destroyed, but those who have faith. And Joshua 11 speaks truth after truth after truth over your life and over my life, and that is this. You plus God equals victory. You plus God equals majority. If God is for you, who can be against you? Amen. I want you to note something now regarding chapter 11. Sometimes God will move supernaturally. Sometimes God will indeed perform a miracle. He'll do something that's so beyond us that we are incapable of doing, and I think he does that pretty much all the time, but there are times when it's less evident than others. And up to this point, we've seen the supernatural, miraculous power of God, and other times God will look for you and I to lean into his track record of keeping his word. He will look for you and I to take him at his word, that he is faithful, that he's not a man that he should lie, that God would never lie to you, that God will never tell you something that won't come to pass. If God spoke it, if God said it, if it's in his word, you can guarantee it's going to come to pass. He honors his word above his name. And there are times where we have got to understand that God might not come through the way that you thought he would because he's looking for you to rely on his word. Joshua understood this all too well. If you look at the end of the book, let me read you two separate verses. At the end of Joshua's life, at the end of the book of Joshua, the first one's found in chapter 21. Not one word of all the good promises that the Lord God has made to the house of Israel has failed. All came to pass. And then in 23, and now I'm about to go the way of all the earth. In other words, I'm about to die. And you know in your hearts and souls, all of you, that not one word has failed of all the good things that the Lord your God promised concerning you. All have come to pass for you. Not one of them has failed. It's no wonder Joshua at 85 years old could still be saying out loud and proud, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? So we're seeing God now looking for Joshua to trust, to lean in. It's, it, it takes me to two separate thoughts here, takeaways, if you will, from chapter 11. The first brings to mind Gehazi with Elisha. You've got Elisha the prophet, Gehazi the servant, and they get woken up one morning and they're surrounded by the enemy. And Gehazi begins to freak out. He thinks we're going to die. This is it. This is the end of the road. This is the end of the line, Elisha. And Elisha has to pray and open his eyes in order for him to see that what he sees in the natural is not what is actually taking place and that supernaturally God has surrounded the enemies that have surrounded them. And then I read about Joshua, though, who's in a similar scenario. They're facing this massive horde of horses and chariots, and yet Joshua, without hesitation, pursues. If you read in verse 7, it tells us, it talks about, it says, immediately they rushed at where the enemy was camped. And I wondered, why didn't Joshua need to have his eyes opened? Why didn't Joshua need to see that God was with him? Why didn't he need to have some supernatural revelation that there was the heaven's army alongside of them? And the fact of the matter is Joshua didn't need his eyes open because he already had a word from God. God had already told him, I'm going to give them to you slain. That was the word that God chose to use to tell Joshua how he was going to deliver over the enemy that was coming against them. That word slain in the Hebrew means I'm going to deliver them over to you without the very thing that gives them the essence of life. 
I'm going to give them over to you without their soul in their body. I'm essentially giving them over to you as dead men walking. They don't even know it yet, but they're already defeated. They've already lost, and they don't even know it yet. They're rising up against the people of God, and they don't even know it, but judgment has already come upon them. I will give them over to you slain. And if that wasn't enough, then Joshua had already had a word from God that was spoken previously. If you remember several chapters earlier, they're in the valley of Shechem, and they've got Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim, and they're reading the promised blessings of God when they walk with God, when they walk out the blueprint of God's plan for their life. And one of the parts of the blessings that would have been echoing in Joshua's ears, in between his ears, in his mind, in his heart, in his soul, that they just echoed through the valley of Shechem in the presence of God, in the presence of the men of God, was this. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before you. They will come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. He had a word in the moment and he had a word in the past. And it's important to differentiate the two because sometimes God might not give you a moment in the present where he speaks directly to the situation, but he's already said something to you. He's already spoken a word in your past that speaks to the future. That's the only God I know that can do something like that before it ever comes to pass. He knows it's going to come to pass, and he can speak a word in time right now, right here today, that's speaking five years from now, three years from now, two years from now, a week from now. He had already spoken it in season. He had already spoken it. They had already declared it. If we're walking with you, Lord, if whatever enemy rises up, they will be defeated. Not only that, but they can come however they want and unify however many ways they want and unify in one place, they're going to attack one way, they're going to run seven different ways away from us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I guess this begs the question for you in the midst of your battle that you're facing, in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the horde, in the midst of the enemy, in the midst of the world, of all the different things, things that come against your peace of mind, things that come against your peace of heart, things that come against anything that you can name in your life, do you have a word from God? Do you have something that God has spoken that you can stand on, that you can lean into his faithfulness, that you can lean in to the living and active word of God? Because flight says run. Flight says it won't work out. Flight says give up. Flight says wave the white flag. It's all over. And I'm here to tell you, if all you've got is a word from God, you've got enough. If all you've got is a promise from God regarding your life, your situation, whatever you're facing and going forward in, you've got enough. And that'll be enough to put the fight in you to say, but God said. I know what everything looks like, but God said. I know what people are saying, but God said. I know what my mind is even saying, but God said. And you can cancel those things out, and you can stand with assurance, and you can stand in the fight in the power of God. The other takeaway that I found is this. It is God's instructions to Joshua, and it might not seem like much, and it actually might seem a little cruel and unusual. He tells them, I want you to hamstring the horses, and I want you to burn the chariots. I want you to hamstring the horses, and I want you to burn the chariots. Hamstring the horses. That sounds pretty aggressive. Don't call P-E-T-A. It's going to be okay. Coming at Joshua, going to sue him. By the way, if you don't know, that's people for the ethical treatment of animals. Or in my case, people for the eating of tasty animals. <laughs> Anyways, moving on. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Some of y'all cheered more for that. Stuff I've been praying and crying over all week. That just came to me. <laughs> But what it boils down to when he tells him, hamstring the horses, burn the chariots, is trust. It's trust, man. It's not just God being cruel and unusual to horses or burning up chariots. And this time, like, this is Joshua needing to trust in the Lord. You know, I loved at the end of our missions month, we had Selwyn Bodley come and speak and he talked about the husks of our life. And he talked about a, 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 a ear of corn and how the husks are designed to protect, but that doesn't do the corn any good in producing more of its kind. It actually keeps it locked up from its potential, from its full potential. 
And, and, and that's what could happen here is like the husks of our lives represent those things that we put our trust in other than God, those things that we want to use to protect us. It's a security blanket. It's something that we can cap, keep wrapped around us so that we don't have to fully take those steps that God's calling us to take. Or maybe it's just a thing that you defer to when you feel triggered or whatever it may be. You fill in the blank. But where God's saying, I need you to trust in me. And so why was it so important that he hamstring the horses? Why was it so important that he burned the chariots? They represented the most modernized form of weaponry in that age, in that time. It was the most sophisticated military that could have been. It didn't get any more sophisticated than horses and chariots. That, as you can see, Israel had none of that. They just marched in form, in line, and in battle. And so Joshua hears from the Lord. He says, listen, when you go take that city, I want you to take the most important military strategy that you could ever have. I want you to take the one thing that could take this military to the next level, man. You could actually be a world superpower with these particular items, these particular things in your military. And I want you to do, I want you to destroy them. And I'll tell you why. Because Joshua, I want to be your weapon. I want to be your weapon. I want to be your military strategy, Joshua. I don't want you to trust in horses. I don't want you to trust in chariots. I want you to trust in me. I want you to trust in my name. I want you to trust in my capabilities. Yeah, it makes sense to take them. They, he gave them everything else to spoil if you read about it. They got all this stuff is spoiled, but he says, not the horses and not the chariots. Don't you dare take those because then you'll start to trust in them more than you trust in me. I want to be the one you rely on. I want to be the one you trust. God's got to be the one that we lean on when it doesn't add up to our own understanding, to our own carnal mind, to our own logic. But we still say, God, I'm trusting in you. Everything in the world says do X, Y, and Z. Everything in somebody or something else that's not godly says to do this, that, and the other. And that will get you by. That will be the move. But God, I need to trust in you. Hamstring the horses, burn the chariots. Second Corinthians chapter 10 talks about the arsenal of God. It's not carnal. It's not what you can think up. It's not what you can strategize in your mind to be victorious or be successful. It's divinely inspired. Listen, I don't need to ask you where you put your trust. Church, I don't need to ask you where you put your trust. I just need to see what you do when a crisis hits. I just need to see where you run, who you run to when things go south. I just need to see how you respond when your world's crumbling around you, when things didn't go the way you thought they would. And I wanna make something very clear. Running to the Lord is not flight. That's the greatest form of fight. That's the best fight you'll ever have, is running to the Lord and getting him on your side because you'll always come out victorious. And I got to tell you, like, I, I, I got to this place and like, you know, as I pray and I study and like, I'm just going to be like bare bones honest with you. Like, I, as I pray and I study and like, I believe like God, as he lays things out, what, I, what he puts on my heart to share, I, I can navigate. It's like streams of water. And I see sometimes like a step ahead or two steps ahead and because I've read ahead, you know, and I've studied ahead and, and I know the next place and like, Like I saw where I was supposed to go, where I thought I was supposed to go next, you know, where, where like the, the hardening of the heart and, and I could preach on that and the Anakim and the giants and, and the Nephilim and all, and I thought I could preach on that. And then, but I got to this place of trust and where you go when things aren't well and what you need when everything is causing you to just feel that internal angst and that pull, that tug of war that can sometimes take place between the life that we're in and the one that we know God is pulling us towards. And, and I just sat and like as I sat and prayed and studied and I navigated these streams, I just 
felt such a lead weight of the Holy Spirit hit my heart and I began to weep. I, I, it doesn't happen all the time. I cry a lot when I do my sermon writing in a good way. It's good tears, but sometimes convicting tears. But this particular one, it was just a weight and I just sobbed in the presence of God because I knew the streams had hit a dam and God said, this is where I need you to stop. This is the deep waters. And the deep waters for some of you today are that you need rest. You desperately need rest today. You need a rest for your soul. You need a rest for your mind. You need a rest from your striving. You need a rest from whatever it is that you have been going, 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 going. And God today is saying, let's find rest. Let's find rest in me today. And what I saw like as I wept and as I prayed was some of you running here and there and everywhere thinking this is what's going to give me rest. This is what's going to alleviate what I need to find rest. And each and every place you ended up brought more emptiness. It brought more lack of fulfillment. And for those of you that are in the fight today and you are in the battle and you are feeling fatigued and you are feeling like, I need rest, Lord. I need rest. I want to read something to you from Victorious Christian Living by Alan Redpath. It says this. There is nothing, no circumstance, no trouble, no testing that can ever touch me until first of all it has gone past God and past Christ right through to me. If it has come that far, it has come with a great purpose, which I may not understand at the moment, but as I refuse to become panicky, as I lift up my eyes to him and accept it as coming from the throne of God for a great purpose of blessing to my own heart, no sorrow will disturb me, no trial will disarm me, no circumstance will cause me to fret. I will rest in the joy of what my Lord is. That is the rest of victory. And if you don't have a word today and you need a word today, I'm going to give you one. And I typically, I never usually read out of the message version, but I don't know why God dropped it in my heart to do so today. And it really stuck. It really hit the mark for me at least. It says this in Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. We're gonna receive communion in just a few moments, but before we do, I just guess the question that's looming in my heart is, where do you need rest? Where do you need rest today? I, I don't think I've used this phrase before, but it just really kind of made me chuckle, but at the same time seemed really appropriate. This is your come to Jesus moment. Because Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. This is your come to Jesus moment. And so before we receive communion, I just want to give you an opportunity to find just a few quiet moments in the presence of God and experience his rest, his presence the comfort of knowing he's with you, he's for you, and he's not against you. And so as Matt continues to minister, I'm just gonna take, before we receive communion, just a, a, just a moment or two for you to just take a deep breath. And this was the phrase God gave me, to know and understand for each of us, everything's gonna be okay. Hey, Pastor Dave here. Just want to say thank you so much for tuning in to our YouTube channel. Uh, make sure if you want to stay up to speed with all the videos that we're going to post in the future, you subscribe to our channel and uh, share it, get the word out to everybody. Lastly, make sure you go to our website. We have our DNA there, everything the church uh, is about here at Glad Tidings Community Church and all the different ministries that we offer. You can go to www.gtcc.church. Again, thanks for tuning in. God bless you.